Third Sunday after Pentecost, and today's Mass we commemorate the octave of All Saints Day, and also we have the uh, prayer of the Holy Ghost, the preface, the preface of the Blessed Trinity. Uh, there's a number of announcements. The Mass schedule is known in the bulletin. Uh, today, uh, it's first Sunday of the month, so we bless the religious articles after Mass. Please bring the communion rail, and uh, after Thanksgiving prayers, I'll bless the articles. Uh, and then we've got the second Mass, of course, all Saints Day party after the second Mass, and uh, potluck after Mass as well at the second Mass. Also, as I mentioned, on All Saints Day, uh, the Sunday following, which is today, one may gain the Totsius quotes his uh, indulgence. Uh, as mentioned on All Saints Day, there's several requirements necessary for doing so. Uh, if you have last Sunday's bulletin, I'd give the seven steps, basically seven conditions necessary to fulfill the, the, the totius quotius. And also, to that back to today's bulletin, I put in just a, I'll say random, just a number of intentions we can pray for. Sometimes we forget about, or we don't think, well, who can I pray for? Who can I pray for? If I, did a Totsius quotes for this, who can I do so? So I put a list, I did a few years ago as well. But just to give a brief, ex a brief summary of the All Souls Day intentions, first off, it has to be something specific. It can't be just anybody in general. You can't say just a, the Totsius quotes, you can pray for them in general, the priest, the church does so. But for, to gain the indulgence, it has to be someone specific, whether you know their name or not, so you can designate somebody, the one who's suffering the most, the one who's in purgatory the longest, one is going to release the soonest, or someone has known to pray for them, whatever it might be, one, one farthest from being, re whatever. You designate somehow. So I have some designated. It uh, has to go to confession within a week, and the Holy Communion within the week, bef to the week, the week before or the week after, within that week time to, to do so. So if you went last Sunday, that would suffice for this Sunday, or if you go next Sunday, that would suffice likewise for this Sunday for a communion, Holy, Holy Communion confession. Uh, Likewise, you must have the intention of gaining it. You can't come back and say, oh yeah, I did everything there. I guess I did it. You have to have the intention of gaining the indulgence. So uh, that would be there. And gaining the totsius quotes means on this Sunday and on All Souls Day, you can do as often as you say the six Our Fathers, Hail Mary's Glory Bees, you can gain the indulgence. But you have to actually step out of the church as if you're coming in again. You would be coming in again. Then you can do it again. The prayers likewise has to be vocal. It has to be vocal. You don't have to shout them out. You don't have to whisper them out. You, leastwise, uh, you'd have to mouth the words. Uh, as a priest would do when he recites the breviary, he has to leastwise mouth the words there, even though there's no designation as to how loud to say them. But certainly, if no one's here, if it's not disrupting anybody, say the prayers out loud. But otherwise, one has to at leastwise mouth the words. So that's just a summary. And then also, I just put in the bulletin, some other uh, means of getting, uh, good, perform good works for the poor souls in purgatory. Uh, if you can do them, certainly you'll have a patron for life, if you will. You have someone who'll be interested in you for life if you assist them. Shorten their time in purgatory, help them get out of purgatory. There will be those who, uh, they'll certainly be appreciative of that and they will not forget you in that matter. So during the month of November, especially the church wants to remember the poor souls, and just all the poor souls that have passed away. The prayers that I say before Mass, and my own private prayers, I have a little book, and it, uh, and it mentions different categories of people to pray. And one of them is to those, those who are to pray for not just the poor souls in purgatory, but to pray for benefactors, friends, family, those who are in their last agony, those who ask me to pray for them, all the different categories. And so uh, you can do something similar to that as well. Pray not only for the dead, but pray for those who are about to die, that they have a good death. The epistle appointed for today's Mass is taken from the epistle of St. Paul to, to the Philippians, chapter 3, verses 17 through 21, through chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Brethren, be followers of me, and observe them who walk so as you have our model. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and their glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things, but our conversation is in heaven. From hence also we look for the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, who reformed the body of our lowness, made it like to the body of his glory, according to the operation whereby also he is able to subdue all things unto himself. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and most desired, my joy and my crown, so stand fast in Lord, my dearly beloved, I beg of Evodia and of Bisich Sinchiche, 
to be of one mind in the Lord, and I entreat thee also, my sincere companion, help those women who have labored with me in the gospel with Clement and the rest of my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. The gospel appointed for today's Mass, taking the gospel of St. Matthew chapter 9, verses 18 through 26. At that time, as Jesus was speaking to the multitudes, behold, a certain ruler came up and adored him, saying, Lord, my daughter is even now dead, but now come lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. And Jesus, rising up, followed him with his disciples. And behold, a woman with a trouble, who was troubled with an issue of blood twelve years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment and said within herself, If I shall touch only his garment, I shall be healed. But Jesus, turning and seeing her, said, Be of good heart, daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. And when Jesus was come into the house of the ruler and saw the minstrels and the multitude making a tumult, he said, You have place for the girl is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. And when the multitude was put forth, he went in and took her by the hand, and the maid arose, and the fame thereof went abroad into all that country. Thus far the words of today's holy gospel. And when Jesus came come into the house of the ruler and saw the minstrels and the multitude making a tumult, he said, Give place, for the girl is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. You know what's sad is that they would laugh him to scorn. Laugh, cause, scorn our Lord. Can you imagine our Lord being embarrassed? Laughed him to scorn, like they mocked him. They mocked him for what he said. And it's nothing new. It carries on to this day. Our Lord gives a, gave us the laws that we must abide by. He gives a church we must rule over us. He gave us commandments we must follow. He gave us precepts that we must uh, submit to. Uh, and he placed us, gave us the ability to save our souls uh, by being, as St. Paul said, being followers of him. So I'd like to just, I guess I'll say, finish up with my series of etiquette sermons and then basically into one of the precepts of church on marriage. And I'd like to have one last sermon on marriage or preparation for marriage because it is so important. One of the questions that I think young people or anyone contemplating marriage, not just young people, anyone contemplating marriage, is, this is how, uh, the question they should ask themselves, how can they make sure of a happy and successful marriage, a good marriage, a marriage that will uh, enable them to find happiness in this world and obviously happiness for all eternity. Uh, you look around and someone's contemplating marriage or the age of, marriage, age of marrying, uh, they can look around and one can see, in many cases quite obvious, there are many unhappy and unsuccessful marriages. And I think it'd be reasonable to say that no one wants to enter into a bad marriage, no one wants to enter into a, what I call a tough marriage. Um, they would like to avoid such things. So what, uh, there's some basic, a number of basic principles I guess we could, I could lay out say uh, that if followed, it'll, it'll uh, remove a lot of the, the doubt as to having a good marriage. It will lay the foundation for a good marriage. And so it's not just my own experience. I have 40 some years experience, and I feel sorry for those that I had to deal with 40 years ago. <clears throat> and back then, people used to say, oh, he's a young priest. Well, it was irritating, but it's true. And now, I'm not a young priest, but it's not just me, 40 years of experience. Um, it's the church, the centuries of experience that, that, the, that the priests draw upon. Uh, what priests of years ago, bishops of years ago, what the church in general has always taught and, and, and the principles laid down. So really, it's a worldwide knowledge that the church has. And they came down with certain rules that were set down for in pre for preparation for marriage. Once someone's married, they're married for life. And at that point in time, they're probably set for, as a general rule, whether it's gonna be a happy marriage or a, a sad marriage. So the, the point that is most important, or very important, is uh, preparation for marriage. And once they're married, then they gotta to work to even continue that which they started before marriage. So the preparation before marriage, 
Nowadays, the word is dating. A better word would be company keeping. Um, and this company keeping has a direct bearing on the relationship as to whether it's going to be a happy, <clears throat> happy marriage or not. And so there is some conduct, some conduct that must be avoided in company keeping in order for those who wish to desire or those who desire and wish to have a successful marriage. Successful marriage means not just being married for 40, 50, 60 years. Successful marriage is where they can live together at peace, live together in harmony, and uh, find happiness there, and assist one another to save their soul. That'd be a, that'd be a successful marriage. So the rules, if these rules are observed, what I'm gonna mention, the chance of, a of, a, of an individual entering into a disastrous marriage is vastly diminished. Of a person entering into a, disast a disastrous marriage, it's vastly diminished. So what are those rules? Well, here's a few rules. First off, and I mentioned this a few weeks ago, first off, don't start company keeping until, you're, until both the individuals are able and willing to think about getting married within a reasonable time. Both able and willing. Able, able meaning being able to support a family, take on the responsibilities of a family, uh, fulfilling the duties as a husband and wife and mother and father. Um, they should not think about, about company keeping. Uh, if it's gonna be spread over a long period, a prolonged period of time. It shouldn't be a prolonged period of time. There is no set standard. It has to be three weeks or six weeks or six months or six years. There is no time. The circumstance sometimes will dictate how long it should be, but in general, it should not be extended out over years. Another thing I'm coming to dislike a lot, I find, I found now with cell phones, and this is not the church experience, it's my own experience, is that uh, couples start company keeping and they're on the phone talking to one another all the time. I, I don't know, but years ago, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 100 years ago, uh, you would, you would, if you were any, you see each other on Sunday, he might go over to her house, she might go over to his house. Uh, they might have some time with, uh, where, and, and during those times they would come to know the family, and knowing the family gets to know the, 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 the possible future spouse. And they're serious about it because they don't have a lot of time together, so they've got to got to be serious about getting married and start making some good preparation, start studying the family, start studying the traits, start learning who they are, the person they're interested in. And uh, so they, but with the phones now, they're talking all the time. And they just get to know that person. They don't go over and see the family so much. They don't see, get to know the family. And they don't really get to know that person because on the phone, and I always say this, the phone is second best. If I got to talk to somebody, the phone is second best. It's not like in person, that's for sure. And if one's talking all the time before marriage, I, I was even told secondhand that the, the, a couple says, well, now we got married, we don't know what to talk about. They talked about everything. And if they talk about business, the business of marriage and carrying on the marriage, I guess that's fine. But I think every day, it's, I think it's too much. I really do, and I, I can't pin it down to any one objection. There's just a lot of number of indications. I don't think it's a good idea. I think it, it, it breeds, one thing, I think it breeds uh, an, an undue familiarity, not being face to face. It puts down that guard of, of uh, chastity, of mo or modesty, and it can evolve into conversations that would not be uh, conducive to uh, chastity. I think that would be one main one. I think that would be it. But in general, I think, I think it's too much. It's far better they go over and visit her family, visit his family, and be around the family, get to know the family. I think that's far better. So uh, if it's going to be, and if it's going to be prolonged, uh, it, it's not good. And once again, if it's a long distance relationship that can be longer, if someone is going to get married and this, uh, an illness comes up, uh, maybe someone has to go off to war, has to travel to the other side of the world because of business, uh, be starting up uh, whatever it might be, so they're going to be gone six months or more, 
okay, then maybe one can put the marriage off to a year maybe or something of that nature, I don't know. But it's just, uh, the priest has to see what's the circumstances and he has to see from the experiences, is that enough to put it off or should they get married or it'd be better to put it off to get married later. It, that'd be something, sometimes it, it takes a, a priest to determine that knowing some of the circumstances. So in general though, in general, the marriage should not be, the, 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 the marriage date should not be prolonged out for over a long period of time that it might be two, three, four, five, six, 20 years from now, whatever it might be. Um, so that is that. And so one should not be uh, exclusive, exclusive in your company keeping at the very beginning because uh, find out what others are like. Don't just go with one person, try, uh, try out, try out. Uh, go with others, go with others and, and see what are like. If you only have one person, like I read one time, I think it's Father Daniel Lord said, if you, if one of the girl just starts dating, this one girl starts dating one boy from the very beginning, age 17 or 16, and they go to a dance and the boy, he has no rhythm and he, he uh, misses a beat, whatever it might be, and she gets so used to it, that's what it is, but she can't dance to anybody else. Eh? And he can't dance to anybody else either, and they think that's, they think this, you're missing a beat in the, in the, in the step of a waltz, whatever it might be. Uh, it's normal when it's not normal. They, they see only this person, and, and then when they get married, they find out that that isn't normal, and it's, it could be a source of hardship. That's a maybe a poor example, but it gives you an idea of what must be. Uh, and one should refrain from affections because uh, to, to fall into love, as the expression is fall into love, um, it, it can be done, but one can fall out of love too. And in both cases, uh, if one starts showing signs of affection, starts giving signs of endearment, uh, gifts, whatever it might be, uh, it's going to, it's like putting kindling on a, on a match, a tinder on a match, and it'll start burning. And as it starts burning more, you put more wood on, it starts burning brighter, and pretty soon you got a flame that can't be extinguished. That's what love is like. Uh, so pull the logs out of the fire, pull the kindling out of the fire, get rid of the tinder, and the fire dies out. That's what love does. You stop the affection, stop the signs of affection, uh, so and so forth. So don't start giving all the, the signs of affection as if you are married, because a couple at that time are not married. But And if you start giving the signs of affection, it, it, it puts down one's guard. If you're going to do this too soon, and then it, it, blinds, it blinds the couple or the individual from seeing what the other person is really like. They, if there's... They show, give the signs of affections from day one. At day two, they can't see the faults anymore. Day three, they can't see the vices. Day four, they think that's normal. Day five, they want to get married. And day six, they, they wonder who this person is that they married because it wasn't the person that they, they, they married. There's a different person. And then they're unhappy and either they separate, they get divorced, or they live a life of uh, constant battle or whatever the case might be. So be, be cautious about... Uh, have a accompanying this, this company keeping with uh, signs of endearment and affection. Hold off on that. It must be held off. This is, and this, I, I mentioned this, not in order to uh, prevent a couple from having a good time, uh, but f for the solid reason is that it's a dangerous situation uh, resulting in strong f physical attraction uh, from which there may be no prospect for a marriage. So a young couple, a couple of individuals, save themselves for uh, the one they want to marry, not the one they think they want to marry, but the one they will marry, and save it for when they are married. That way it'll be something very nice and something very good. Experience, church's experience now, not just mine, church experience shows that, and I've seen this well, shows that very often this leads to various serious sins to uh, start giving signs of affections in, in terms of in, in acts of endearment. Uh, at that point in time, uh, it leads, uh, it stunts the development, let me put this, I like this here, it stunts the development of character and paralyzes the process of education of learning who this who this person is, 
And it's sometimes, if more times than I would like to see, it leads to a marriage that is tragically unsuccessful. So those of you who are not married, please listen to this and listen to your parents. So very firstly then, just to reiterate, don't keep steady company unless you have a serious intention of marrying. Serious means that you're prepared to take on responsibilities, duties, obligations of marriage. Uh, and I will say probably very few boys and very few girls, or, uh, and probably more so than girls and boys, have a really serious intention of getting married while at school. When I was in high school, a couple got married right out, of, they got out of high school and they got married the next day or within a week or two. Um, and that far as I know at that point in time, that lasted. But that is not always the case. In fact, more often than not, it's not the case. So once again, don't start company keeping or, or, accept, or accepting e even a single date with a married person or a divorced divorce person. And if someone has started dating someone who is, uh, and dating in ignorance to the person's marriage, marriage state, uh, as soon as they find out, they should stop. They should stop uh, immediately as soon as they do find out. Uh, and if anything, then come and see the priest, and the priest will determine whether it's a, his marriage is a valid marriage, because canon law, canon law, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, because I can't quote off the top of my head, but canon law basically presumes in favor of the marriage. So someone, anyone, comes to me, and they say, I've been, I, I'm married to so-and-so. My first presumption is that's a valid marriage. The contrary has to be proven. So until the contrary is proven, this marriage is considered valid until the contrary is proven. And the church, in many cases, the church is very clear about marriage. As far as the church is concerned, a Catholic must be married from a Catholic priest. And if they're not, it's an invalid marriage. A non-Catholic, not being under the rules of the church, uh, there's all kinds of things they can do. And the church basically says uh, if the church, if the individual, uh, non Catholic gets married in front of a minister, a justice of the peace, a judge, a magistrate, and I like to add if you're on, the sh on a ship on an ocean, the, the ship's captain, they all have the authority to marry. And the church recognizes that. And in Montana, in Montana, anyone, you don't even have to have be a registered clergyman or clergy woman, anyone can perform a marriage for anyone. So any one of you can say, well, I'm going to be the minister who marries my brother, my sister, my uncle, or my aunt, or whatever it might be. And uh, that's what the state does. And so it makes it so that easily anyone can get married with the slightest pretext for marriage, and it's considered valid marriage. And so when someone comes to dating a non-Catholic, uh, as far as a priest is concerned, there's probably a marriage or attempted marriage or someplace, and it's, it's a dicey thing to come up and say, well, I want to marry this person. If they're 25 years old, they're 30 years old, they've probably been married or attempted marriage, not just once, maybe twice or three times or four times, whatever it might be. I even had some twice. Someone came and they was married five times. They were trying to get into a sixth one. So it's, it's uh, don't keep company or even accept a, a single date with someone who's married because it's considered, for the, on, the ons, on the onset, it's considered a valid marriage. And if they're divorced, all the more. You don't want to get into that as well. Uh, thousands, I'll say thousands upon thousands of souls are irreparably damaged every year through invalid marriages, or as Christ called them, adulterous marriages. So accept no dates with married persons. Remember that it's a mortal sin to keep company with any person already validly married. So that, that's a, a rule that has to be strict, especially in this day and age, it's everywhere. 40, 50 years ago, it wasn't so prevalent, but nowadays it's just, it's just everywhere because they get, people get, non-Catholics get married, and even, especially in Novus Ordo, they can get annulment faster than you can get married. It takes less time to get annulment. I have a book that says that virtually the Novus Ordo can annul every marriage. And this annulment used to be a process where, in fact, let's say someone got married, they found out they were first cousins. And the church said, okay, annulment is a statement of fact that they weren't married, they could not validly marry, 
and therefore to state that through no fault of their own, they entered into this union, but they're now separated and both free to marry. Nowadays, the church annulment is nothing more than a church divorce, that they can annul or divorce anyone in the Novus Ordo. I can, uh, with the rules of the Novus Ordo Church, I can take the people, someone across the street, the young couple have moved in a couple of houses down, I could go tell them what they could do to get an annulment in the Novus Ordo Church. I don't even have to know who they, I don't know who they are. I just know that they're there and I know they're a young couple and I can tell them what they could do to get a divorce or get an element in the Novus Ordo Church. So as far as Novus Ordo, their annulments are equivalent to divorces and one has to be cautious, careful, and discerning in that matter as well. So uh, don't, another aspect is don't keep company. Don't keep company with a person who proves to be uh, morally unprincipled. A person who is morally unprincipled, it be he or she, insists on using company keeping as a mean, as means of indulging uh, desire, uh, their desires or their, the, getting their pleasures. Uh, someone who does that, they, they undercut the possibility of even having a, happy, uh, having a good marriage. Uh, because such people are rarely capable of fidelity and fidelity is indispensable to a happily married life. People, those who are unprincipled before marriage will continue to be unprincipled after marriage as a general rule. Not an absolute, but as a general rule. So don't rush into marriage without giving yourself a reasonable opportunity to learn about your prospective spouse's character, uh, their principles, their stability, uh, their willingness to work and sacrifice for a happy marriage, because without sacrifice inside of a marriage, without offering up, that marriage is in tough shape as well. Hasty marriages, let me word it this way, hasty marriages are usually bad or tough marriages. So don't let yourself be swept into marriage. Go into it with open eyes. Uh, the choice of your spouse, a partner to be your spouse in marriage is probably the most single important decision that you are ever going to make. Uh, and remember that marriage is for life, so that decision will determine whether you will be happy for life, this life. I'm talking about this life, I'm not talking about eternity. Um, finding happiness in this life. So standing before the altar of God, you will say those words that I take thee for my lawful husband or I take thee for my lawful wife to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. Well, now a number of people, now they say, well, death, there's, he or she's spiritually dead to me now. She died, uh, he died, and therefore I'm free to marry, so they go on. And, and, but to, end, to come for the altar and say those words, uh, and to make this decision, go ahead and do this, if there's a doubt, this is decision, uh, has fa fateful consequences to a happy marriage in this life and, of course, for eternity. Uh, so m any marriage should not be entered into haste and should be with careful thought and prayer. A and, and those entering into marriage, they take a solemn vow. They, they can't put themselves above the church and say, well, the church is wrong in this case. The church has 2,000 years of experience. Yes, this maybe this individual may be hurting, but if everyone would, 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 could break a marriage, could ignore the laws of marriage, ignore, ignore the laws that are required of them, uh, rendering the debt, whatever it might be, uh, reasonably asked, and all the other things that come inside of marriage, just arbitrarily ignore that and determine who, that they themselves have become their own little ruler, tyrant, uh, uh, whatever it might be, uh, God, and they decide what they can do or can't do, that marriage is a tough marriage. It, it's a bad deal, especially for the, for the practicing spouse or the Catholic spouse um, in that matter. So once again, don't keep company with a person who reveals himself or herself is opposed to a, the essential teaching of the church. Sad to say those who, who reject it later, that's terrible. Uh, for example, their stand on birth prevention or divorce or Catholic schooling for the children, a number of questions like that. Make sure they understand and, and, and their word, you have to give the word, they, they, they sign papers, a couple of sign papers, the word has to be good, otherwise what is one's word? Um, 
and there are wives and husbands leading lives that are literally hell on earth, hell on earth because the happiness of the marriage is not there. It's impossible because they have no agreement. There's no agreement between the husband and wife concerning matters of moral importance, particularly to, to the, the practicing party in, in the faith the, per, 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 pertaining to marriage. So those who contemplate marriage don't continue keeping company who, or someone who's completely disinterested in religion or is opposed to religion. I had one young lady want to marry this Muslim years ago, and I explained to her, I don't know the, all the ins and outs of Muslim religion, but I explained to her some of the things I knew, and he was sitting right in front of me, and I explained what it was, and I, I said, okay, and I, I told the gentleman, I said, what I'm saying, is that correct? And he said, yes. And one thing I said was that Muslims consider a wife, Muslim men consider their wife nothing more than chattel. If you never heard the word chattel, just take out the, out the H, and it's literally what they could consider their wife to be. Uh, so don't keep company uh, without reminding yourself. If you go to start keeping com company with somebody, remind yourself that marriage is for life. And that while you can choose re reject a certain individual before marriage, there is no choosing or exchanging spouses after marriage. So when steady company keeping has, has lead, lead to uh, mutual promises of marriage, uh, do, not go to, uh, do not fail to go see the priest. Go see the priest because his job, it'll be required that you get married from a priest, but his job is to make sure that your marriage will be a good one. And that's uh, the goal. So when you start company keeping, you see someone that's con that you're contemplating marriage, go see the priest, go see the priest. It isn't very often, but every you know, so often I'll tell someone, I said, I wouldn't marry that person. Uh, and with good, with good reason, usually, as it comes out to be in all cases. But let the last be, be, bit be that if you're con con contemplating marriage, marriage in the offing, don't wait until after the fact, but go see the priest both couples should probably, uh, if, if especially if, if both, certainly if one's, if both of them should, whether they're Catholic or not Catholic, they should see the priest because once again, his job is to see that your marriage will be a good marriage. And God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.